morning. Every year you guys are all blessed and as we're all very much aware, what's today? What's the first Sunday for today? Hmm. I'm going to ask a lot of questions today. So hopefully Abuna David told me that the English liturgy is always full of youthful people who are awake. So we're going to test. What's, what's today? It's not important. It's just a, any other Sunday. First Sunday of the Paul Matrafouche, yalla, loud. Apostles fast, right? The first Sunday of the Apostles fast, good. Unfortunately, actually not a lot of people would know that. Um, it's, uh, it's funny, because every year I feel like I'm repeating the same tape. Um, I always have this conversation with at least one person, where I'll, ha I'll be like, yeah, it's Apostles fast. And they'll be like, oh, the fast of the servants. Baraka fikum, right? <laughs> That's the, the, the concept that we've, that we've established of the Apostles' Fast, that it's a fast for who? The servants. It's a fast for the servants, that's it, right? So everybody can continue with the holy 50 days. We, we, like the 50 days can go on, and the, and, and the fast is just for the servants. And it actually, it, it kind of upsets me when someone tells me that, because it, it means two things. The first thing, it means that they've established themselves as what not servants, right? They they put themselves out of the circle of saying, oh, we're not servants. And the, it's a double-edged sword because sadly, we've actually made the servant, right, a very formalized concept, right? We've, we've created a servant that is a formalized concept. It's a, in Arabic, they say like a stumba, right? Like it's the person who comes in and he makes sure all the kids go to Sunday school and he's the one giving the lessons. This is the servant, right? Wrong, wrong, absolutely wrong. That, that's a servant, it's a type of a servant, but it's not a servant. We're all servants. In the Catholic epistle today, St. John says what? We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers of the truth. Receive what? The Holy Spirit. Did we all receive the Holy Spirit? Every single one of you has received the Holy Spirit. Yes, you've received the Holy Spirit. Thus, you have to be fellow workers or servants. So to break it to you, I'm sorry, but you got to fast. <laughs> this fast is for the servants, and yes, you are all servants. We should all be servants. And the church has a deep curriculum, and I think the best way I could describe it is if you if you think, like, where are all the doctors at, right? If the doctor comes and puts kind of a, a three-course, I'll call it a three-main um, prescription, right, of a medicine, what would those three prescriptions be if we think of fasting? Those three prescriptions would be what? The Nativity Fast, right? The Great Lent, and what? The Apostles Fast. So those are the pills that you have to take every day for a certain t amount of time. And then every now and then throughout, throughout the year, we throw a few what? More pills at you, right? We throw a few more pills at you because we're all sick. Unfortunately, nativity, we take as, yes, we're re getting ready for the bridegroom, the Savior's coming, we're good to go. The great Lent is, we're all in. But the Apostles' Fast, what is that teaching us? And I think a part of us not fasting the Apostles' Fast is not an, we don't understand that that's the completion. It's the completion. And it, what, what exactly it entails. What it, exactly it shows us. In the gospel today, we read this gospel during the Great Lent, right? What week of the Great Lent? The second week, which technically can be the first week, because the first week is preparation week, right? So the first week is preparation week, and then the second week is the Great Lent. So you hear this gospel again. So it's almost like the opening of every big fast, right? And I'm not going to bother you because I'm not going to bore you, and I'm sure you guys all know of the, the concept of it. But it, the, the church shows the beauty that the gospels are never ending. We can always learn from the gospels. And in the beginning of every fast, we put this gospel in, and there's three main things similar to three temptations that we could learn from this fast through this gospel. The first is we need to understand the Holy Spirit. This fast is a time for us to understand the third of the Paraclete, right? The Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? The second 
Once we understand it, we then know the power of the Holy Spirit. I think we, we underestimate what we receive in the baptism. We completely underestimate it. Once, once we understand the power, we, we then use the power. So the third thing, we, we use. So again, we understand, we see, and we what? We use. Let's take the first temptation. As understanding the Holy Spirit. When Christ, kind of they say, right, right, like in school, especially in college, when the professor says something twice, you should probably what? Listen, right? You should probably write it down. It's probably going to be in the exam. So this gospel is being stated twice. So we should probably what? Listen. There's probably a reason why this is put in there because it's part of, a big part of our exam. When we understand the Holy Spirit, Christ got tempted and he said what? Turn this stone into bread. And what is Christ's response? He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. By every word of God. A lot of the church fathers contemplated on this saying. St. Maximus the Confessor says something very great. He says, the person who loves God's values, knowledge, knowledge of God more than anything created by God, and pursues such knowledge hastily and unceasingly. St. Justin Popovich, who's not related to Greg Popovich, says, by reading the Bible, you're adding yeast to the dough of your soul and body, which gradually expands and fills the soul until it has thoroughly permeated it and makes it rise with the truth and understanding of the gospel. We have to understand what the Holy Spirit means. We have to understand God. And the only way to understand God is by reading his word, living his word. How many of us throughout the week will open our app or open any Bible and read for just two minutes? Even if it's just the daily readings of the day. How many of us do this for just two minutes? On your ride to work, on your, you know, on your lunch break, even before you go to bed, just turning on that cell phone or opening up that book and just reading it for two minutes. How long will that take? Nothing, it'll take nothing but it'll go so much further if you do. Why? Because then you understand the concept of who God is, of what the Holy Spirit is, right? We always have the concept of we have baby Jesus. He comes and he saves us, right? He dies on the cross. But what after? He left us something. He left us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is among us. And through the Gospels, we hear the Holy Spirit. So we have to understand. And that's why Christ always says what? You don't need just bread. You need my words. My words are what's going to keep you alive. The second temptation today, the devil tells Christ what? Hmm. Pop quiz. I know you guys are awake. Yeah. Go. Louder. <laughs> Throw yourself, right? Jump. And Christ responds with him and he says what? You shall worship the Lord your God, and him you shall only serve. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him you shall only serve. What was the second point? We said, we then see the power of the Holy Spirit. And today in the Acts of the Apostles, we see a story about Peter. And Peter went out and he met with who? us, right? The Gentiles. He met with the Gentiles. And he went back and he's telling the leaders of the church what he did, right? Were the leaders pissed? They weren't too happy. They weren't too happy that he went out there. But he says something really interesting though. He says, the Spirit told me to go with them doubting nothing. Doubting nothing. And because of the Spirit's action with Peter, Peter ended up preaching to the Gentiles. He opened a door that I think a lot of us didn't understand when Christ said what? He said, preach in Jerusalem first and then till the ends of the earth. He started at Jerusalem and he told them to the ends of the earth. The, the apostles at the time didn't understand that. They said, all right, cool, we got Jerusalem. 
But it was fulfilled that, he, no, the, the word won't stop there. It'll go more. The power of the Holy Spirit won't just stop there. It'll go more. Once we understand what the Holy Spirit does, its power will live within us, and we see it on a daily basis. We see it on a daily basis. I know some people are going to mission sites, right? And I think mission sites are the best when you see people come back. My favorite thing is not the people going there. My favorite is when they come back. Because they come back and like oil is dripping from them, right? They're like, man, I have, like, I'm, I'm living the dream. I saw God face to face. And then as time goes on, they fall back into this gray area. Why? Because in the mission sites, it's literally white or black. But here, we live in a gray area. We're comfortable. And that comfort sometimes hinders us from seeing the power of the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. But it goes back to us reading every word of God. If I read every word of God, I'm awake, I'm alert. I then see the power of God on an everyday basis. And once you see and taste the power of God, I promise you, you will never ever want to go back. Ever. Peter himself stood amongst the leaders of the church and said what? The Spirit told me. That's power. That's power. And for each one of us, that's, that's the power that we need in our lives today. I promise you, if you see and taste the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll never turn back. The last thing, or the last temptation that we see today, is actually what? Him telling them, worship. Sorry, flip them. We'll go back. We spoke the last one. We'll flip them. We said, we'll say that you shall, tempt, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. The answer of Christ is that you shall not tempt the Lord your God. We should always end up having a mentality of using the power of the Holy Spirit. Once we know it, once we taste it, once we see it, we then need to use it. The Lord kind of, it's, it's kind of a tricky piece, is that, uh, does Christ tempt us? Does Christ allow temptation? He allows temptation, but does he tempt us? No. Right? Absolutely not. For us, if Christ is by our side, temptation means nothing. And not tempting God himself, but rather the temptation that comes from the devil to us. There's a really nice story, and I think this is, it goes back to kind of the service piece, of Ava Musa the, the hermit. Ava Musa the hermit lived in the wilderness of Shahit for 30 years. He lived in the wilderness of Shahid for 30 years, since he was little. And he was a saint among saints. He, he put palm trees on, he lived his life, he was, he was the man. To the point that it says in the story that he would, be, like, he would have all the beasts of the, of the wilderness around him. And they would like submit to him, right? And then, when he did the sign of the cross, they knew that this was the time for him to pray. So then they would what? Leave. They would leave him alone. So he went back to the essence of Genesis and Adam and Eve, right? Where the beasts of the earth submitted to him. And he lived a, a beautiful life until one day the devil wasn't happy. He didn't like this. And he told and he said, I am going to go and I, I need him to obey me. I don't like that the beasts of the earth obey him. He needs to obey me. So the devil disguised himself as an old monk. And he went to Ava Musa. And when he went to Ava Musa, he told Ava Musa that he's an old man. And he stayed quiet. That's it. And Ava Musa served him. But Ava Musa noticed something. He noticed that whenever he prayed, the, the old man would go away. But he didn't put too much mind into it. After a couple of days of spending time with him, 
the old man took Ava Musa out to the wilderness. And they were walking. And he saw a huge palace, a big, beautiful palace. And the old man told Ava Musa that I was very rich and I became a monk and he made up all this big story about him. And he, and he told him, here's where I have all my riches in this palace. So when you guys walk in, like when we walk in, you're going to see my riches are hidden here. So Ava Musa walked with him and they walked into the palace. And Ava Musa continued to serve this old man. And I'm going to underline the word serve, right? He continued to serve this old man. After a couple of days, the old man was about to die. So Ava Musa wanted to do something nice for the old man. So he told him, what do you want me to do for you, for your last days? So the old man told him, I want you to take this palace and I want you to marry my daughter who's in the palace. Okay? I want you to marry the, my daughter who is in the palace. So Ava Musa told him, okay, I'm serving. I'm serving, I'm going to do it. And he ended up, the, the old man dying and Ava Musa trying to un, enter the palace, he fell in a whirlwind and he found himself back in the wilderness where he was at, but this time he was not satisfied at all. He was not satisfied at all. He hated his life. The grass that he used to eat that was as sweet as honey no longer tasted so sweet. He was uncomfortable. So Ava Musa felt really bad. He felt uncomfortable and he just wanted to leave. So he started to try to go back to Alexandria. And more things happened with the devil. Long story short, Ava Musa found himself that he was on a path of righteousness and he ended up where? In the path of discomfort. And he was so sad. He was so sad. I'll read to you what he said at the very end of his story. It's amazing. He says, after returning to his senses, he was greatly sorrowful and cursed himself, saying, Woe to you, O my soul, for you abandoned the path of righteousness and eternal life. The tre to tread upon the road leading to hell and destruction. Woe to you, for you have fallen victim to the passing pleasures of the world in place of eternal riches. Imagine how much riches you have lost. Woe to you, my soul, for you have denied the name of your Lord, God, and Savior. Have you forgotten that he created you and blessed you with a mind and gave you his word so that through understanding you may know what is right and what is harmful? I have disobeyed my God for the sake of satisfying my bodily desires. Woe to you, O my soul, for neglecting God's kingdom in exchange for vain glories on earth. He was a man that was filled with the Holy Spirit, no doubt. But he, w he, was sub he was subjected to the fall of temptation, like any of us. A man that went to the wilderness. All of you are in the world on a daily basis, right? We all struggle on a daily basis. This person's job was just to be in the wilderness. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit, but he also fell into temptation. So how much more do we need the Holy Spirit then? in order to serve God and to, be, to stand firm in front of every temptation that we see, that we may live a life filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the joy. Again, he says what? He says, how much riches have you lost? How much riches have we lost if we fall into, into the sin of temptations? Let's pray that we always put in front of us the Holy Spirit and that throughout this fast, that the Holy Spirit is a concept instilled in us, that it's something that is within us, that we listen to it, that we read the word diligently and have the Holy Spirit lead us as we read every word, that we use its power, that we ask for it on a daily basis. It's amongst us. It's with us. Let's also continue to pray that God renews his Holy Spirit within us on a daily basis. And glory be to God forever. Amen. <laughs>